Welcome to another episode of Handloader TV. And this is the first episode in a very special series we're going to be doing on World War II small arms. And to help me out with this series, we have one of our writers of Handloader magazine here, Mike Venerino, very well known for shooting World War II small arms, his book. And he's pretty much the expert in my eyes and been a big mentor for me when it comes to shooting, handloading, casting, and all sorts of various topics. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to the channel. Thank you so much for having us, Mike. I Thank you. really appreciate it. First off, I'd like to say I'm not an expert, but I do like to be called very knowledgeable. Okay. <laughs> well, he, he's been almost a, a, a mentor and a tutor for me when it comes to hand loading and casting. And if you watched our video on the Pedersoli rifle, you cast a lot of those bullets yourself. Right. So I, I have a little experience at it. Yeah. <laughs> You're pretty high up in the amount of articles and different subjects you've written in the Lyman Cast Bullets Handbook. And yeah, I've so. done that. Uh, 2,000 articles and columns so far. That's so. amazing. I quit counting at that. <laughs> well, to start things off, we figured we'd start out with this Thompson. It's an M1 Thompson submachine gun, correct? M1 Thompson. This one was made in 1942. All right. And you can always tell an M1 from the M1A1 or the other earlier ones, it only has this sight. The M1A1 has ears on this, so you can't actually see the sight. But when the <laughs> sight's sticking up just like that, it's an M1. And this, they went to the M1 from the 1928A1 to cheapen it. When the government start, first started buying 1928A1s, they were selling to the government for over $200 each oh, wow. in 1941. They redid this one and got the price down to $44 each. So the big difference. government was real happy about that. So they only take, that where the earlier ones only take the, uh, well, they take the stick magazines of 20 rounds or 30 rounds. Uh, the earlier ones took the drum magazines that everybody sees in gangster movies. Right, See? right. The iconic look. Yeah, but this one won't take those. Uh, cyclic rate on these is about 700 rounds a minute. Oh, okay. So it takes some experience to control them, but they're a lot of fun to shoot. I think this is probably the most iconic submachine gun in the world. I, I can believe that. I yeah. mean, when you think of Thompson submachine gun i mean it's just from 1928 they met how long did they manufacture the thompson for do you know off the top of your head the first ones came out in 1921 21 okay. and colt made them okay of all things and they were exquisite quality and those were the ones that had the drums and the violin cases and you know the such things as that they only made 15,000 of them okay. and when World War II began in 1939, there were still a few thousand of them in stock. They weren't a good seller. Really? Yeah. Everybody thinks that the gangsters just bought them all out. They didn't buy that many. The newspapers made it sound like they bought a lot, as they do today sometimes. <laughs> For sure. Uh, and But the U.S. going into World War II knew they had to have some submachine guns. So they started buying the 1928A1s, and then, as I said, they went to this to, to cheapen it a bit. And a little known fact is that every American tank that went overseas in World War II had either a Thompson submachine gun in it or the later M3 grease gun. We'll get to it shortly. Hmm. Everyone had a, a, gun, a submachine gun in the turret. Now, what about its role as an infantry weapon? It was primarily carried by officers, or uh, how, how does... Well, officers could carry whatever they wanted. But in a regular squad, the sergeant, the NCO, carried a Thompson, and the rifleman, well, carried rifles, we'll see. So it was mostly an NCO's weapon. In combat, uh, in the open, out in the woods and such, they weren't that good because they're, mm -hmm. they're short range. The effective range, they say 100, 200 yards. It's actually about 50 yards to, to oh. hit something. But in towns or in the jungle in the Pacific where you're fighting close, they were very effective then. Right. Now, just out of curiosity here, what's the barrel length on one of these? All 
Thompson submachine gun barrels are 10.5 inches. 10.5 inches. And as you probably know, they're very heavy. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. A lot heavier than they look. You go to grab it, and the first time you grab it, it's kind of like, oh, wow, there's, <laughs> there's some mass there. It was interesting. I'd like to tell a little story if we have time. Uh, we did a, a benefit for some cancer patients. And so I took my submachine guns, and we told the people 20 rounds, $20 for 20 rounds. And I thought, boy, we're not going to get much business. Well, I stood up at 10 o'clock that morning, and I didn't get to sit down until 3 o'clock that afternoon. And there were some women that come by, and they had their one ticket for 20 rounds. <laughs> and they shot it, and they come back with a whole string of tickets then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. People love shooting these. I've never seen anyone shoot one of these that didn't leave with a smile on their face. I believe that. Yeah. It gives me a smile just talking about it. Yeah. And Thinking about getting to shoot it later on, I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, good. And as most people already know, chambered to 545, uh, excuse me, ACP round, but actually some of the 1921s were chambered for 38 Super along the way. Really? Yeah. Now that I didn't know. That's very yeah. interesting. And those are very, very rare and expensive. Uh, I can believe that. Yeah. Yvonne and I paid more for our first house, or as much for the this as we paid for our first house. <laughs> yeah, they're not cheap, that's for sure. Yeah. They're, they're uh, well, they're just special. They are special. Mm -hmm. A piece of history, built to last. Mm -hmm. I mean, when did you say this was manufactured? 1942. 1942. It has wow. a very early serial number. Okay. So with it being such an old firearm, what are some of the things that go along with maybe caring for it? Is there anything in particular to note that you should do, shouldn't do, do's and don'ts? Uh, yeah. Uh, don't put any pressure, like put it in a vise and put pressure here. That's a very thin piece of metal after they machine it. You could collapse that. Uh, I would like, I have another barrel. I would like to put it on someday, but I'm going to have to get a specialist who mm -hmm. has the tooling for this. Uh, other than that, just oil it, use regular solvents on the barrel. One of the benefits of the Thompson over some of the others is that the 45 automatic cartridge shoots cast bullets very well. Okay. So you can save a lot of money with this thing by shooting cast bullets in it. Really? And they shoot very accurately, no problems at all. We'll shoot some when we shoot them. Okay, that's really neat. Yeah. I really like that. Because I imagine these things, you can burn through some ammo pretty quick. <laughs> that can get pretty pricey. Yeah, that's right. So when it comes to hand loading for it, then, that begs a question. Anything in particular? Cast bullets are okay? Any... We well, have to use cast bullets. I size them 4, 5, 2 inch. 4, 5, 2. Point four, five, two inch. Uh, fast burning powders, bullseye, Winchester 231, Hodgson HP 38, uh, Accurate number two, and I think that covers the, the gamut pretty pretty well. Uh, there's nothing else to it. You make sure you taper crimp the bullets. You don't want them loose in the case. Okay. Other than that, it's simple. You just load them the same as you would for your 1911. That's really neat. Really neat. What's your uh, favorite load for the Thompson? Do you have a favorite, a pet load, if you will? I do. Uh, it's 5.4 grains of Winchester 231 and 230 grain Oregon Trail hard cast bullet. Oh, all right. Uh, I don't even bother to cast them myself if I can, if I can buy them for this thing. I don't want to spend the hours casting that many bullets. <laughs> don't blame me there. And, and I like casting bullets. <laughs> me too. But I imagine that would, it takes a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I take this out to shoot, I take an ammo can of ammo because you're going to need a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a lot of fun to me. Yeah. Well, on that note, I suppose it's time to take this thing out and do some shooting with it. That's right. And I'm going to make you carry the gun and the ammo. That's a deal <laughs> if I get to shoot it. <laughs> so I brought the ammo, like you said. You got the Thompson. You did the carrying until we got right here. <laughs> <laughs>
So, how do you work okay. this thing? This is a safety. It's okay. on safe right now. This is on single shot. You might want to try that your first few shots. Okay. You put the magazine in the screw, tap it, make it sure it's in there. The bolt's already back. Here, let's put the bolt down. No, safety's on. The bolt's already back, so all you'll have to do after you take the safety off is point the gun and fire it. Because it fires from an open bolt. Open bolt. And remember, if you want to hit it, fire in two or three, four shot burst. Okay. Don't just empty the magazine. As fun as that sounds, I That's will refrain. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll get out of your way. You go to work. Okay. Sounds good to me. That is too much fun. Everybody has that look on their <laughs> face after they shoot a Thompson. Oh my word. Too much fun. So Mike went ahead and handed me some cast bullets in this magazine. So we're gonna go ahead and try these out. Cause I'll be honest with you, that's too much fun. You can't just shoot one magazine, right? We're right on full. So we're out on the range and we just finished a long day of filming with all these awesome, awesome full autos. And we figured we'd do this uh, kind of all together like You're right. with all the full autos. So that way we kind of had some time behind each one of them and we could talk about them. We'll have individual videos on each of these awesome World War II firearms. So be sure to check out each one individually. But as far as a conclusion goes, for me, my personal favorite has to be this STG 44, MP 44 is this one's mark. Yes. It is a super cool gun. It's the first assault rifle ever made, definitively. And uh, it's a neat intermediate cartridge. It's pretty accurate in semi-auto. Gets away from you pretty quick in full auto. Oh, though. Yeah. And then of course, you gotta have the Thompson in there. And again, we'll have individual videos on all of these. But I had so much fun out here shooting these things. I learned so much just listening to Mike talk about them. And we didn't even skim the surface. If you really want to learn more about these classic, iconic, historical firearms, be sure to check out his book, Shooting World War II Small Arms. It's an awesome book with low data, tons of information on it. And Mike, I have to thank you for coming out here and doing this with us, opening up your home, your shooting shack. I have to give a special thanks to Ted Tompkins for being the uh, official gopher. Full, yeah, the, the gopher. gopher. The gopher. I mean, he was running back and forth, brought us lunch, brought us food. I really appreciate that, Ted. And Mike, I don't have enough good things to say about you. I really appreciate this. Shooting your ammunition, your time, your guns means a yeah. lot to me. I'll tell you what, Jeremiah. I had just as much fun sharing it with you, and I'm proud to be included in this. It means a lot to me. And as for my favorite, that's the MP40. It's one of the least practical, but I saw a lot of movies in the 50s and 60s. <laughs> and they all had those, right? That's right, yeah. For sure. As a young kid, I grew up watching combat and shows like this, so getting to shoot these firearms is really a dream come true. And we got a lot of great performance out of all of them. The Nambu really surprised me with its simplicity and its accuracy. Mm -hmm. The Lewis gun did pretty good too, but as you were saying, it's not quite zeroed. That's right. Yeah. So we got to cut it a little bit of slack, but it was a lot of fun <laughs> to shoot. Great cartridges. The Sten, a simple mass produced submachine gun mm -hmm. that worked. Yeah. Kind of the same thing with the grease gun. They put it in tanks, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. 
And so we got I gotta learn a lot about these. Well, don't forget the M2 carbine. And the M2 carbine. What an a, awesome, accurate little rifle. If you were in a tough spot, that'd be the one to have. Probably the most practical, you were saying. Definitely, most practical. Most practical. Well, thank you so much for watching. We really do appreciate it. And uh, again, a special thanks to Mike and Ted Tompkins for making this all possible. Don't forget to hit that like button. Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're notified when we post our next video. And as always, if you have any questions or comments or personal experience with these guns, we'd love to hear about it. Be sure to leave those thoughts in the comments below. And until the next episode, we'll see you later. Mm -hmm.